You're listening to the Play Like a Girl podcast, episode number 15. You play ball like a girl! I'm Nikki B with Play Like a Girl, made just for female athletes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Play Like a Girl podcast. I'm your host, Nikki B. Here at Play Like a Girl, we aim to encourage more confidence in young women who play sports and give them the necessary tools and advice to have an amazing career in sports and beyond. If you are a young woman who plays sports and lives an active lifestyle, or you know one of these young women, I am so excited you are here. Each week, we will either bring you a guest in the sports world or have a roundtable discussion of the many taboo and important topics in the world of female sports. Are you with me? Let's change the game. Ladies, oh my goodness. Okay, today I interviewed AJ McCord, who is, again, another amazing guest on the Play Like a Girl podcast. AJ is a sports reporter from COIN in Portland, Oregon, who brought so much wisdom on her journey there. She started her career in the San Diego market while going to school at Point Loma Nazarene, interning for big names like the San Diego Padres and NBC San Diego. While at NBC San Diego, one of her dreams of sideline reporting for the San Diego Chargers came true. She went on to become a multimedia journalist in Fayetteville, Arkansas, learning that the path to your end goal is not always easy or glamorous, but you have to keep climbing up that mountain to get to the top. Her advice at the end is so good, but I highly advise you to listen to the entire episode to learn how she has become a trustworthy, empathetic, and just a badass reporter. All right, Plague listeners, please give a warm welcome to one of our friends, actually. A few of us here (laughs) at the Play Like a Girl studio know her, but please give a warm welcome to AJ McCord. Thank you so much, AJ, for being on the podcast today. Yeah, of course. I'm excited to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you. We have like mutual friends and so um, they they sing their high praises about you. So I'm so excited <laughs> to be talking to you. And I feel like you kind of live out my dream job, like being a sports reporter. <laughs> so I can't wait to dive into all that stuff. So before we do, let's um, have our listeners get to know you a little bit with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so first one, where are you from? San Diego. Awesome, where did you grow up? Also San Diego. San Diego, okay. <laughs> and then what sports did you play growing up? Um, anything the school offered up until I was in about eighth grade, but gymnastics was bread and butter. I did that for 16 years. And then in high school, played soccer a little bit, um, played flag football anytime it was offered. Dang and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you name it, I did it. Surfed a ton. San Diego stereotype, uh, I suppose. <laughs> definitely. Well, if you live yeah. in San Diego, I feel like you have to surf at least a little bit, like yes. just recreation, recreationally a little bit. Um, and then, but you grew up in San Diego, but where do you live now? So now we're just outside of Portland, Oregon. Awesome. Cool. And then what is your favorite quote? Oh, gosh. Um, it's actually probably not one that has to do with sports right now, mostly because we live in the Pacific Northwest and I'm equally obsessed with getting outside as I am anything else. And so my favorite one currently is your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. I love that. Oh my gosh. And that can, <laughs> that can totally be relatable to sports. It can kind it of relate can. to anything. Um, yes. yeah, it just means like your mission is out there. Your adventure is out there. Go after it. I love that. Okay. <laughs> and then what is one of your superpowers? Oh gosh. Um, let's see. Well, I wish I had a superpower. Probably the closest thing I have to it is I'm pretty empathetic, which, um, bodes is a good thing and a bad thing I think in this industry but I'm like very empathetic so I feel what other people are feeling Mm -hmm. um pretty much anytime I talk to them that's amazing but I think as a reporter that's a pretty good quality to have because you can connect with them on a deeper level um and really understand what they're feeling and kind of get to the root of whatever it is you're searching for um in your interviews and stuff so that's amazing and then lastly who is your favorite athlete Oh, man. Um, Probably my favorite athlete, like, of all time, 
would have to be one of them is Allison Felix because I think she's just a freaking stud and Mm -hmm. just has done amazing things um, all over the place. And but pro- like growing up, I was a diehard Chargers fan. So Ladanian Tomlinson was like my the one that I wanted to meet someday, yes. which still doesn't happen. But oh, one day you got to manifest that. <laughs> one girl. day it's gonna happen. So I know. who's your favorite athlete that you've interviewed though? That's what I want. Probably the favorite one I've interviewed um, is Travis Pastrana. He's just awesome. like a hoot and a holler, and every time. <laughs> I would go to interview him. It would totally get off track, but it was for rally car. And so it wasn't really supposed to be formal. It wasn't supposed to be like hard hitting. It was, we were both just dirty from being out on the course for 14 hours. So it was always fun. And I always felt very comfortable with Travis. So. Oh, how fun. That's, That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Well, before we dive into all of that, cause I can't wait to hear about your current career right now. Let's chat about your path to get there. You talked a little about, bit about how you played basically every sport growing up mm-hmm. um, while you were growing up in San Diego, but just walk us through that. Like what sport, what was the first sport you started playing and what did you play all throughout school up until high school? So started out playing softball. Um, which was fine, but I did, I did mommy and me classes with gymnastics too. So I kind of started both those at the Mm -hmm. same time. Um, and then softball turned into one of those situations where I was the kid in the outfield doing cartwheels. And so (laughs) I was like, well, maybe this is not, my parents were like, okay, maybe we should let her kind of go to gymnastics because clearly she's doing it anyway. So that's when I kind of made the switch to gymnastics. So kind of the like, I guess, quote unquote childhood years, you know, from like, six to about 14 well six to 16 really was just gymnastics all the time um my husband still teases me because those 10 years right which are so formative of like learning culture I didn't Mm -hmm. learn that because I was in a gym and so like my taste in music is off because we listen to country only at the gym and so I never listened to like whatever was popular I never watched movies because I was always at the gym and so um, I didn't have a great like cultural, you know, experience because mm-hmm. all I was was in the gym and um, broke my back uh, my senior year of gymnast or of high school. So at that point, it was pretty much uh, the dream to go collegiate had kind of died. And gymnastics, like at fourteen, you know whether you can do it long term or not. Mm-hmm. And by long term, you know until you're twenty six. So <laughs> by fourteen, we'd realized I wasn't going to the Olympics. So I kind of started switching to just doing it with high school and um, stopped doing it competitively to attempt to salvage some sort of life, I suppose, (laughs) my high school years. So I went out for soccer, played soccer my sophomore and junior years of high school, um, and then went to college and um, again went out for the soccer team and they offered me a walk-on spot, but at that point I knew that I was, I wanted to do sports broadcasting and I didn't really feel like the travel schedule was um right. conducive to that and so and I was like very I was super enthusiastic I was very like aggressive on the field but I was really not great at soccer but I was like <laughs> sent out to like scare the defenses because I would just run through people so I wasn't gonna get a lot of playing time is what I'm getting at so that's oh why my I, God. Decided that's to, awesome. I decided not to do that and so I became a groupie which is how I met many of our mutual friends. I was the girls soccer groupie because I thought they were the coolest thing ever. So oh my gosh, um, that's amazing. How yeah. cool. well before we get into like soccer and all that and going into college. So I am intrigued about your like gymnastics journey. Um, because you said you kind of didn't have a life. It was like in the gym 24 seven. So talk yeah. a little bit about that because I know, you know, it's probably hard for a kid to just be super dedicated like that but like what do you think it takes to um have that dedication and that drive and just be in the gym 24 7 what do you think attributes to that well i think i was just super competitive and Mm -hmm. so i really wanted to be the best and Mm -hmm. gymnastics is unique in the requirements because you know like there's so many things that you can do for other sports outside of the practice facility like for soccer you can go run sprints anywhere for Mm -hmm. football you can run drills anywhere but you can't you have to have a beam to practice gymnastics (laughs) and so I think that like it's not that gymnasts put in more time necessarily 
but I think they also, in addition to peaking younger, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you're you're old at 16 in gymnastics, right. and people are wondering when you're going to retire, and you <laughs> don't have a license. And so mm-hmm. I think that um, I think you know, and and the gym was family. I mean, it was we were all there all the time together, and so some of my best friends from childhood were, you know, from the club and. Um, so I, I think I, I didn't have a childhood in the normal sense, but I still came out of it just fine. I just, right. uh, you know, didn't, I, I wasn't seeing movies on the weekends. I was going to meets and, um, after school I wasn't hanging out with people. I was going to, to my six hour workout. And so, mm-hmm. um, but I think it comes back to, I, which is still true. I'm just very competitive. And mm-hmm. so I want it to be the best. And I kind of had honed in on gymnastics and I thought it was totally awesome how many things that you could convince your body was like okay to do even Mm -hmm. though like now that I'm older I'm like wow it's a miracle I didn't break more bones and like get more (laughs) hurt when you watch these women and what they do um but you know when you're young you totally think you're invincible and so that's Mm -hmm. what I thought and I thought it was like the coolest thing ever so that's amazing it's so true I think um I think the big difference between like really good athletes and okay athletes, of course, is that competitiveness because mm-hmm. like you can have natural ability, you can work at it, but even no matter how hard you work, if you don't have that like competitiveness inside you and just that fire to be the best, yeah. it's going to be pretty difficult to be the best of the best. So, um, and then talk to us about, I didn't know that you broke your back. So how was <laughs> that? And like, when did that happen? And how was that experience for you? Well, apparently I did it twice, but I didn't know about the first time until the second time. So I was, so when I was 18, I was still competing in high school, but high school gymnastics is like pretty mundane compared to, um, competitive gymnastics. And so I was doing high school and I went for a tumbling pass and just, it just landed wrong and I couldn't, I couldn't move. It hurt so Mm -hmm. bad. But remember, like gymnastics, every gymnast has back pain. Like it's not right. – It's so I'd had back pain my whole life and I didn't really think anything of it. And so then we go to the doctor and he was like, okay, so you have a – they call it a Scotty dog fracture. And so – which my husband is now in med school ironically, so he's learning mm-hmm. a lot about this and I feel like I'm learning about my childhood injuries all over <laughs> again. But um, So we went to the doctor and he was like, well, this is actually you like re-broke something that was already broken. And I was like, what? And so apparently when I was, which I remember the incident, but I didn't realize I'd broken my back. When I was 12, I was playing hide and go seek in my backyard and I climbed on the gazebo and the gazebo broke. So I fell like onto the cement or concrete, whatever we had below. And I remember my back hurting like crazy, but a Scotty dog fracture is interesting in that it's not, it's almost like a hairline fracture for one Mm -hmm. of your vertebrae. So it's not like this, you know, I I didn't have to have cortisone shots. I didn't have to, um, I was really lucky in the kind of break that it was. And so he basically was like, you know, I can give you some pain meds and you can go back out there and keep going. And so that's what I did. And the doctor was like a family friend. And so he knew, Mm -hmm. you know, this was my senior season. This was kind of the last hurrah of me being an athlete. And so he knew a competitive athlete, I guess. And so he knew that, you know, it was really important for me to me to get back out there and that I would deal with any amount of pain as long as I wasn't going to like, you know, paralyze myself or whatever. So he got me back out there. So from 12 years old to what, like 17, 18? Yeah. You had like a hairline fracture, almost basically like a broken back for that long. (laughs) Apparently. And I I mean, it must have healed at some point in there. Right. With gymnastics, like you're constantly tweaking, you know, your back is doing things that you never have to do in another sport. And so, like I said, I mean, everybody had back pain. So I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's yeah that's absolutely (laughs) insane to me like i can't imagine how much pain you went through and thinking that it was just normal and okay so it just goes to show for any of our listeners just make sure that you get everything checked out and (laughs) really pay attention to your body like if something hurts yeah like yeah things hurt from time to time but if it really hurts like there might be something a little bit more serious going on but so and you ended up still competing did you ever end up getting back surgery no, no, it's, and it still hurts, but it's like, 
it's a it's a pain like the I don't even know if it if I could get surgery which this mm-hmm. is just my like medical ineptitude at understanding what <laughs> is going on but um I don't know like surgery was never presented as an option and so um it was just kind of like you know the only way to make sure it doesn't hurt is to not do anything Right. <laughs> Which is like Rest. not, not going to, yeah. So that was like not an option. So I just kept, kept going. <laughs> yeah. Fought through it. Wow. You are competitive. I love this. This is amazing. Okay. So talk about, um, you said gymnastics, you kind of stop really doing that competitively and maybe just doing high school gymnastics versus mm-hmm. like club gymnastics. Um, so when did you start playing soccer and talk about you like getting that walk on spot and turning all that down? I want to know about that. Well, so um, I went to, so I started playing soccer mostly because all my friends were doing it. And mm-hmm. because like in high school, I would like managed to make friends, which, you know, was new outside of gymnastics <laughs> because I'd never had time to make friends. So I was like, oh, they're all playing soccer. I should do that. And so I did that and I was really fast. There were a lot of things from gymnastics that carried over. I was, I was really fast. I could read the, I could read the plays pretty well, but once I got the ball on my foot, it was a hot mess. Like I couldn't, I couldn't shoot. I could like sometimes pass, but really what I was good at was like being intimidating and running around like a chicken, like with my head cut off because (laughs) I just had endurance. And so, um, I played that my junior year and then senior year, they offered me a spot on, uh, they were like, it was kind of the same thing as what it was at Point Loma where it was like, well, we'll like give you a spot, but just know you're not going to play very much. And I was like, (laughs) well, I'm not going to do it if I'm not going to play. Like that's a waste of my time. And so I decided not to do that. And then at Point Loma, I was kind of intrigued again. I was like, well, I'll just go out. And the coach was super wonderful. And I think it was as much a pity offer as it was like, (laughs) hey, I think you'll be helpful to the team. And, you know, he was like, well, you could potentially – you know, walk on and offer you that spot, but you're not going to play very much. And so I think for me at that point, like I'd, I tasted what it felt like to have a life and to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and soccer wasn't like a love for me that had, I'd had for decades. And so it wasn't worth like, oh, now I am going to school at this great campus that I can surf every day after class. And like, Mm -hmm. I can make friends and like go out on a Friday night with my roommate. Like, I'd never had any, I'd never had a Friday night free before. We always right. practiced until 10, 10 at night. And so, and Saturdays were for competition. So it was really my first taste of having a weekend. And I was like, eh, it's not really worth giving up. And I knew that, you know, I'm not going to go anywhere competitively with soccer and knew pretty, I knew at that point that I wanted to go into sports broadcasting. So I thought it'd be better if I got used to the sidelines as opposed to the field a little earlier. <laughs> right. Well, before, sorry, I just want to backtrack a little bit because I want to <laughs> talk about for gymnastics, was it hard on you? Because you said soccer wasn't like what, it wasn't your passion, it wasn't your love, but I think maybe gymnastics was. Was it hard for yeah. you to give that up and kind of, or did you, were you kind of okay with it because you realized you could get, you know, a Friday nights back, you could get yeah. hanging out with friends back. What was that like for you? You know, I think by the time I quit competitive gymnastics, not only was I in a ton of pain from my back, which Mm -hmm. at 16, you know, I didn't really know why, why it hurt so bad, but I knew I was. And I was so, I'd gotten to the point where things were scary and like, I wasn't, um, I wasn't enjoying it anymore because I was afraid it was going to hurt or I was afraid Mm -hmm. I was going to fall and get more hurt. And so by the time I was done with it, I was I was done. I was burned mm-hmm. out. I, I'd given a decade of my life to this sport. And at that point, I felt like it had given me, you know, fear and pain in return. And right. so I wasn't really, um, yeah, I wasn't really dying to stay in it. And that's mm-hmm. why I ended up quitting. Yeah. No, I think that's awesome. I think that's good accepting, you know what, you've had like a great stretch doing it and it was fun while it lasted, but there's other things out there because I think a lot of times for athletes, they have to identify themselves as athletes. Like, Oh, I'm a gymnast. And then once they're not a gymnast anymore, it's like, Oh my God, who am I? So I think that's awesome that you're kind of able to walk away and then actually do something else. Um, and then, so for soccer, where did you originally get that offer for the walk on spot? At Point Loma. It It was was, like, I'd already, yeah, I'd committed. I was at Point Loma Mm -hmm. and they were holding like walk-on tryouts and I was like, what the heck? And so 
That's awesome. I did. How did you choose your college? I think that's a big decision, obviously, that, you know, high school athletes have to face. Um, Well, all high school students, but especially for athletes just figuring out whether or not they want to play in school. Um, So how did you choose Point Loma as your school? Yeah. So at that point, I wasn't really interested in like competing athletically in college. And so it was kind of once I was at Point Loma and they offered the walk on, I was like, well, I might as well give it a shot. But it didn't play a big role in my decision. My dad was actually a counselor at Point Loma. And so I had um, the chance to have a very nice break on tuition. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to that, they had a great broadcast journalism team Mm -hmm. or program. And so I ended up going, that was what really led into it was I didn't really want to leave the beach. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't like the, really the only hangout for Point Loma was that, um, they didn't have a football team and I Uh. loved football and I wanted to be a sideline reporter for football. And so Mm -hmm. how on earth can you do that if you don't have a football team in college? But I met with the head of the journalism department and he was like, well, we don't have a team, but SDSU has one and the chargers were there at the time. (laughs) And so um, you know, he was like, we can get you internships covering football. And so he kind of convinced me like, that's not as big of a deal as you might think it is. Um, so that's how I ended up choosing Point Loma. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I mean, it's Point Loma. I don't know (laughs) if the listeners haven't seen the campus, it is freaking beautiful, like heaven on earth. If you talk about maybe one of the prettiest campuses ever, um, but (laughs) Google the baseball field. That's Yeah. Or the track, either of those, if they don't convince you that it's gorgeous, I don't know what to tell you. Right. You're crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, talk about, I think it's so cool that you knew pretty early on what you wanted to do. How um, did you become interested in sports um, broadcasting and broadcast journalism? How'd you know that that's what you wanted to do? So it was, um, it was actually, it was, I guess now having, I, I was, when I got to college and people didn't know what they were going to do with their life, I was like confused because I had known for so long, like I grew up in a household where the women were teaching the men about football. Like my my mom and my grandma, yeah, my mom (laughs) and my grandma had season tickets to the chargers. They were diehard chargers fans. And so they went to every home game growing up and, um, we, you know, when they were away on Sundays, my mom, and my grandma's Sunday would revolve around the Chargers game mm-hmm. and everything else worked around that. Whereas my dad and my grandpa were like kind of into it, but not really. And so I learned from my mom, and my grandma, the rules of football and um, the passion for football, I suppose. And so I remember like very distinctly when I was 16 and probably about, yeah, I think 16 and watching the games on Thanksgiving with my family. And this woman came on, she was a sideline reporter, I learned later, right? (laughs) Um, But I didn't know who she was at the time. But she came on and they were, obviously it's Thanksgiving, so they're talking about like the traditions that players have. And I remember thinking like, how cool is that? That she is like this liaison between the players and the fans who just love this game and like love watching these guys play. And like, what an honor to get to do that. Cause I would do anything to talk to, Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I think it was, I think it was Ocho Cinco. I think it was the Bengals and the Jets. And so, you know, she's telling me about Ocho Cinco and I'm like, man, I would, that would be awesome to get the opportunity Mm -hmm. to talk to Ocho Cinco, you know? And so I think that, um, I think I saw her and went, man, like, that's what I want to do. I want to be that liaison for like, between the players and the people who love them so much, like my mom, my grandma, you know, I would, it would be an honor to get to tell them what the chargers were thinking or what went into that play, like why they were having a good day or a bad day or whatever. And so that's kind of how I knew that, um, like from that moment on, it was all I really thought about joined the journalism program in high school, chose Point Loma because of broadcast journalism and Mm -hmm. did internships based on that. And so it was just a pretty straightforward and I knew that I couldn't do like a nine to five desk thing. Like I go crazy. (laughs) And so I knew I had to be outside. I knew I had to be running around. Like I knew all of that. And so 
it fit very well. Yeah, you seem to me like someone that has a lot of energy. And so I can't imagine a nine to five job. I can see you like no. already out there just like on the field, you know, getting all the information you need running around. I love that. And I think it's so cool that your mom and your grandma were like the big sports uh -huh. fans in the household because that's not a story that many people have. So I think it's so cool that like, they instill that in you. And then of course, I think you'll instill that in your future kids. I think that's just like the coolest thing ever. Um, so yeah. talk about too, like your, when you were at Point Loma and um, you were kind of nervous because they didn't have a football team. So, yeah. um, but the professor said, it's all good. Like we have yeah. the chargers, we have SDSU. So talk about like the internships and your experience. And um, I'm sure for you, that was like living the dream, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. I remember calling my mom like the first time I was at chargers practice and like crying. I was so nervous. I was like, I mean, I, I got an internship I think the summer after my sophomore year was the first one. And then the summer after, oh, and then my entire junior year was interning. And so the junior year was when I, so I, my first internship was unbelievable. It was um, with the Padres and um, I was Dick Enberg's like right hand man, which if anybody doesn't know who that is, they need to look him up. Cause he was like <laughs> the grandfather of sports broadcasting. He passed away, um, last December, but he was like, he was not only a mentor to me, but he was like a second grandfather. Like oh. he would call me and see how tests were going. And I would went to Vienna to visit a friend who was studying abroad and he called to make sure I had everything set and knew what it was like to travel abroad. And, um, I learned so much from him because baseball was never, I mean, I played softball, but baseball mm -hmm. was not like my favorite sport in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because I'm like very active and baseball is not the most active of sports, right. I, there's an, I've grown to appreciate it for what it is, but you know, 16 year old me was like, this is kind of boring. Um, and so now it's obviously very different. And I think a lot of it has to do with him because Dick taught me just the beauty of storytelling and mm -hmm baseball provides a like a a space for storytelling that few other sports do because the action moves so fast you don't really have time to pepper it with story after story and like weaving these things together and so I learned so much about how to do that from him and I spent every home game at the Padres um, at Petco Park I was there three hours before I stayed an hour afterwards and I just sat up there and had my little headphones on in the booth and mm -hmm. um, you know, my job before the game was to go out and get interviews with the players and kind of get the vibe of the game. And then uh, during the game, my job was to kind of keep them on track. So like they started down this tangent, I was supposed to try and find a way to like bring them back um, in some sense, but mostly it was just to listen. I mean, these guys are seasoned pros, so they didn't really need me, but they <laughs> let me in, which was such an honor. And so I loved that internship. I got to rub shoulders with like just some of the most amazing people. Trevor Hoffman was up in the booth with us. Tony Gwynn was up in the booth with us. Vin Scully was there every time the Dodgers were in town. And so that was like my first taste of like meeting these people that I had, you know, looked up to. I mean, I remember going, I think it was Trevor's 500th save. And I remember being at the game as a fan at like nine years old, you know, mm -hmm. and like hell's bells and all the stuff that would play <laughs> for him. And, so it was just wild. And then after that internship, I went straight into an internship with uh, NBC San Diego, so the local San Diego affiliate. And that is where I feel like I learned a lot of um, just like being thrown into the fire, I guess. I had a wonderful boss, I guess he was then, um, there, Derek Togerson, who's still there. He's one of their sports anchors and reporters and um he would take me everywhere with him like he would take me to chargers practice he would take me to the charger girls calendar unveiling he would take me to marshall fox events he would take me to sdsu like took me everywhere and he was always like okay well it's your turn to do the questions and so i was like oh my gosh i don't know anything about anything you know and so i think he really taught me a, the value and importance of being prepared because I learned very quickly that if we went <laughs> somewhere and I wasn't prepared to do the questions, not only would he still make me do it, but I would feel very embarrassed because mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared. And um, 
he would always have me do stand-ups afterwards. So he would always, you know, but he would only give me like, it wasn't like he like babied me and was like, okay, we can take it, do it 10 times. You know, he was like, no, you get one shot and then we got to go. So I learned a lot about getting on my game quickly, which I think as a gymnast, I was lucky enough to kind of have instilled in me because you don't get do-overs in gymnastics. It's not like, you know, in football, you can make up for a play later by making it, you know, a great play later Mm -hmm. on, but you, you don't get to beam routines. So like, I think I learned that from gymnastics and I kind of thrive in that, um, probably dating back to gymnastics. So those are the two internships that I had in college that were just amazing. That is so cool. I mean, I think just the experience you got, obviously it helped you with your career today and just like shaped you into the person you are. I'm sure you are uber prepared now for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and just like have, working with those people, I think that's what, you know, makes it or made it so exciting and probably just like put a, a spark in you to like continue to do it. So that is just yeah. so cool. Um, so what do you think because I, I know, for me personally, I know the importance of internships, and obviously you do too, but um, just going off of what we talked about, like, I guess, not necessarily like what's the secret to getting internships and jobs, but like, what do you think, um, I guess, is the importance um, or just knowing like what are the right internships and jobs to get into? Because it sounds like to me, you're someone who just asks and like goes for it. Um, yeah. So, but how did you know like those would be the right internships for you? And how what would be your best advice to students who are in college who are looking to get an internship or some sort of summer job? Yeah. Um, well, so I think the internship side of things, like we had the director for the Padres come in and speak at a class. And afterwards, he, like, casually mentioned, like, oh, yeah, and both Dick and Berg and I are going to be looking for internships or interns for the summer. And I was, like, straight mm-hmm. to the front. I was, like, okay, I want to know what it's, you know, what I need to do to intern for <laughs> Dick and Berg. And, I mean, I sent him email after email, and then I interviewed at Dick's home, and um, it got the job. And I remember getting the call and, like, being downstairs on Christmas break and my mom being upstairs and Dick's name comes up on my phone and I'm like, Mom, it's Dick Enberg. And she like runs downstairs and I answer the phone and I'm like, Oh yes, thank you so much, Mr. Enberg. It'll be such an honor to, you know, a little whatever, stuttering all over myself. And then <laughs> hanging up the phone and just crying. I was so excited. So I think that um and I mean, I'm sure you have too, but like I've spoken at a couple different college like events, their journalism schools or whatever, and we have interns at coin Mm -hmm. like we have a say even in who our interns Mm -hmm. are and so i think if you're in college and you have someone come speak to you there's not really an excuse for not creating a connection with that person Mm -hmm. like they're they're there because they're one of the ones who wants to invest in the next generation you know like the ones who don't want to invest don't go speak at colleges like it's very simple and so if you have someone coming to speak at your class and they work for somebody that you think it would be cool to intern for, ask them, ask Mm -hmm. them what it's like to be an intern, ask them what it would be like, you know, what it's like to, to apply for it. How does that work? How often do they do it? If they don't take internships, can you be a job shadow? Like everything that I did came from the previous thing. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing in college that was standalone except for the speaker coming in the first time. But after the internship with Dick, I got the internship with NBC because I'd made friends with the NBC San Diego people while I was at the Padres. I got a job with NBC San Diego because I'd done a good job with the internship. And so everything is interconnected Mm -hmm. and especially because this is a small business. And so Mm -hmm. even in San Diego, the same people working the Padres games are the ones working the SDSU games are working the Chargers games. And so they all know who the decision makers are and you just have to ask, work your butt off to be Mm -hmm. one of the ones that they want to push ahead. And so I think that that was probably the biggest key to getting an internship is just, you know, connecting face to face because you don't want to, the last thing you want to be is one of a hundred, you know, pages that they see come across their desk. Totally. I love that you brought that up. It's so funny because one of my internships in college that I had for like two summers um, was because someone came in to speak in one of my, um, what was it, a sports marketing class. So yeah. literally one, it was, um, they 
my professor and this guy had wrestled together in college with mm. Uriah Faber, who they all went to UC Davis together and they all wrestled together. Um, and I ended up interning for Uriah Faber's mixed martial arts team um, for two summers. And it's so true. Like, you know, I, I didn't know what would come of that internship, but like, as they were talking about it, I'm like, it's in sports. It's like marketing yep. and social media and PR communications, exactly what I want to do. And yeah, you just got to like, I think bite the bullet because I think people like, especially young girls will kind of be afraid. Cause like, Oh, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if that's what I want to do, right. but that's why you just have to go up there and ask and figure it out. Like you'll never know yeah. if you don't try. And the worst yep. that they can say is no, but most likely they won't. <laughs> yeah. So, and an internship is never going to harm you. Like right. it's better to find out in an internship that you don't like the industry than yes. it is to find out in a job. Like, yes way worse so find out early in an internship like oh pr is not for me oh right. marketing's not for me oh on air isn't for me like these are things that you should learn as an intern because then you can apply for the jobs that matter and start working your way towards where you want to go as opposed to having to take all these detours because you didn't know what you wanted definitely yeah that is just so cool and like you said like the i obviously like the broadcasting industry and especially in San Diego is very interconnected but as is with most industries like usually whatever industry you get into in your market whatever area you're in they're pretty interconnected so like if totally. you do an internship somewhere like you said that may lead to a job somewhere else which may lead to an another job somewhere else mm -hmm. so like you said you got to get out there in front of people you got to ask and you just got to have the confidence to do it so I absolutely love that that's that's <laughs> too funny that we both had similar stories but yeah um, so talk about now. So you're with Coin. You are a sports reporter. Yeah. Talk about your move to the Pacific Northwest because you're in Portland now. So how'd you go yeah. from San Diego to where you are now? Oh, gosh. We had two steps between that. Um, so <laughs> after after uh, I graduated, I so in college, I was a whitewater rafting guide also the yes. <laughs> couple summers. So fell in love with Colorado, fell in love with the outdoors. Um, I started applying for jobs when I was like in December of my senior year. Cause I think I had like five credits left and I was like, I don't really care if I graduate. <laughs> I just want to like start working. And so like, if they'll take me without a degree, then I don't need a degree, which is probably not true. Stay in school. But, um, <laughs> I didn't get a job until September of the year I graduated. Um, and I got a job with Universal Sports, which is now the Olympic Channel. Mm -hmm. And I actually got a job behind the scenes. So I was a writer researcher for them. Um, and it was really fun. It was something that um, I, I mean, the Olympics is obviously like a, a sporting, a collection of sports, I guess, that is very near and dear to my heart as a gymnast and as a snowboarder and mm -hmm. as someone who loves kind of those sports that only get the spotlight once every four years. Um, so I was stoked. I worked on their show leading up to Sochi 2014. And so we had like basically a sports center for all the qualifying events once a week. So we would break down all the qualifying events that had happened in the world of Olympic sports that week and put it in an hour show. So I was writing, I was researching for that show. I was helping to find guests for that show. Um, and then I, I worked very hard and I was pretty upfront from the beginning of like, Hey, I'm very happy doing this. But just so you know, like long term, this is what I'd like to do. And so they were also very gracious in letting me get in front of the camera, do stand ups, do uh, reads and things like that. So I did that for about nine months, put another reel together. And then I got a job with Rally America, which was so much fun. It was a very short season, but it was a blast because if you don't know what Rally Car is, it's like if you take, if you like take a, take NASCAR outside in like the dirt roads mm -hmm. in the woods. <laughs> That's what it is. So these guys are doing like hairpin turns and they're Subarus at like 90 miles an hour. So that was where I met Travis Pastrana, which gives you an idea of the type of person who likes to do like Travis Pastrana is an adrenaline junkie. Right. Um, so that was a blast. I did that for about six months, did some whitewater rafting in between there and then got a job in Fayetteville, Arkansas um, as a weekend sports anchor and reporter so I moved there, did that for three years, um, almost three years, and it was, um, it was definitely the hardest job that I ever had, just because small market there are mm -hmm. 
small market is a small market and there mm-hmm. are things that come along with that that you'll be very grateful are no longer a part of your life later but um <laughs> they're very invaluable and one of the things that I did there was I was also um I was sports mainly theoretically but if there was any news or any severe weather that happened I got pulled onto those things mm-hmm. so spent 3 years there learned a ton got a lot better and then um my husband in those three years also got married. Um, and so my husband was applying for med schools and he got into a med school in Oregon and he got into one in Arkansas and, you know, we were kind of trying to figure out where we wanted to go. And I was like, you know, Oregon is like way more, I think what we want to do and, um, has more of the outdoor things that we want to be in. And then, you know, as from San Diego, I want to get back to the West coast if we can. And so, um, moved out here without a job and then interviewed, with coin that like the day after I got here, I got a call like as I was driving out from my agent saying, Hey, they want to interview you. So interviewed, didn't hear anything for like a month, found out I'm very (laughs) bad at being unemployed. Like I get really (laughs) bored. I get really antsy. I get very anxious. I'm like not good at not working. So this is good to know someday. I think if we have kids, I'm probably (laughs) not be a stay at home mom. Um, but ended up getting the job with coin, started part time with them and then went full time earlier this year. So it's been a whirlwind of a year and a half since moving here, but it's been a blast. Totally. Oh my gosh. Well, that's totally an amazing story. And I want to know more about like, cause you talked about being unemployed does not suit you, <laughs> but like, so what's it like, I guess, kind of, um, just keeping going, you know, like you, you were in Arkansas, you said it wasn't probably uh. the best fit for you. Um, but how do you like keep that end goal in mind and really just like keep going after it and I guess not give up? Yeah. Um, it, for me, it all came down to my support system between my husband, my agent and my mom. Those three got the bulk of the tears, the emotions, the dramas, the, I can't do this anymore. The, this is not what I signed up for. This is not, if this is what it is, I don't want it anymore. And, um, you know, my, my mother is obviously my biggest cheerleader. And so she was like, this is not forever. You can do this. You're born to do this. Keep going. Mm -hmm. My husband was like, I'm here for you, whatever you want to do, babe. Mm -hmm. Like you can do whatever. (laughs) And I was like, but I want to do this. And he was like, I thought you just said you didn't want to, you know? So he was like trying to figure out how to help, but he was like the day in day out, like, okay, well let's go get ice cream. Let's go get a glass of wine. Like we'll just put this day behind us and hope tomorrow's better. And my agent was great because she's obviously been through it with many clients before me. We'll go through it with clients after me. And so Mm -hmm. she was the one who was like, listen, like, this is why I know you're going to get out of here. This is why we can't get out now. She was a very practical encouragement where it was like, I've been here, I've done this and you will get out, Mm -hmm. but we can't get out now. You know, you have to work on this, this and this. And so for me, it all came down to the support system um, of people reminding me when I couldn't see it for myself that like, this is what you want to do. This is what you've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Do not let, um, for lack of a better, like, do not let, do not let someone else decide to take this dream from you. Like if you end it on your own, then that is fine. Mm -hmm. But do not, they also obviously compelled the appeal to the competitive aspect in me. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, do not let them win. Like, do not let this drama, do not let this, whoever, like Mm -hmm. the, the assignments that you don't want to do, like, do not let them win and take Mm -hmm. this from, and as soon as you're like, well, don't let someone else win. I was like, okay, you're right. I'm back in the game. You know, I got this (laughs) (laughs) just watch me now. (laughs) Exactly. It was like, okay, we're going to do this. That's so cool. And it's so true. I think a support system is one of the best things that you can have because of course we don't all have good days there's gonna be good days and bad days and having some like a few people in your circle that you can rely on is just key i think to just keep you know pushing you forward um along with yourself and just motivating yourself but um i want to know too because when you started out like how how was it how was your journey from when you like your first times being a reporter um and how scary that was and like what have you had to do along the way to get better um and like just become a better reporter because i'm sure within time you've gotten better and better and better and i think the one thing with a lot of people they think that 
you know, being an on air or being a reporter is just very glamorous, but I'm, I'm sure <laughs> there's a lot of unglamorous and a, there's other yeah. things behind the scenes that you don't see. So, um, talk a little bit about that and just how you, you, yeah. you know, just keep getting better. Yeah. So in Arkansas, you want to talk about unglamorous. Um, <laughs> I was an MMJ, which is a multimedia journalist for mm-hmm. those who don't know. Um, and I can tell you that there is almost nothing glamorous. I couldn't find – there are some women and men who are fantastic MMJs. Not me. I was <laughs> like – I and it wasn't – I got very good at certain aspects of it, but then mm-hmm. I could not – like I've been running around sweating all day, and then all of a sudden I have to look presentable for TV. And I was like, this is so dumb. I hate doing my hair. I hate doing my makeup. I can't be good at both these things because it takes a lot of effort for me to be ready for TV. And, um, so there are certainly unglamorous aspects of it, but mm-hmm. I think that, um, again, I mean, my agent was wonderful. I think that one of the things I learned pretty early on in Arkansas, which was probably because I was certain that I was not going to live out my contract there. I was certain mm-hmm. I was going to get swept up, you know, before it was over and that was, which didn't happen. I was there at the duration <laughs> of the contract, but, um, you know, I always had a tape ready And so I was constantly updating that. And I think because I constantly updated it, it might seem like pretty OCD and maybe a little like, not entitled, but a little like presumptive to be like, oh, you're going to get out of your contract early. But I really, that was the goal. The goal was Mm -hmm. to get out of Arkansas. And so even though I I have a great amount of respect for what I learned there, I don't think I would trade my time there at the time all I wanted was to get good enough to get another job closer to home with, you know, just in, in an area that I was more comfortable with. I'd never been to the South and so things like that. And so because I put together a reel so often, I was constantly like accosted with how much better I was getting from month to month because Mm -hmm. I could, I was, I was constantly replacing clips, you know, Mm -hmm. like, it would be, it, I would have this reel together and then the next month I would do something that I was like, oh, this is pretty good. I want to put it on the reel and I'd have to take something out. And so I think that I was reminded pretty regularly, hey, you are getting better. This mm-hmm. is serving its purpose and you're not just like dying here. Like you're right. <laughs> you're moving towards the goal. And I think my agent brought that up time and time again of like, look at this is your first reel. This Mm -hmm. is the one when you have now a year and a half into it, look how much better you are. And I mean, even still at coin, there are things that I've, I've gotten way better at since Mm -hmm. I started there versus when I left Arkansas, which you wouldn't think that that would be the case necessarily, but, or versus now, I guess. And so, but I think it, as you do it more and more, you just get more comfortable with who you are and putting that on TV. You know, when you first start, you're just very like, so the Lions and the Tigers played last <laughs> night and you're very like robotic and you just mm-hmm. read and you try to just not screw anything up. And then as you get more like I'm I'm a sassy person. So mm-hmm. I'm learning how to be sassy on TV and people like that. They like mm-hmm. seeing who you are. There's a million people who can read highlights, but right. I want to read it the way I read it. And, you mm-hmm. know, in the interviews, like if a player makes a joke, I'm going to make a joke back or like I'm going to take a jab back, like whatever it is. And people want to see that. And that was something I never would have been comfortable doing Mm. at the beginning ever. And so, and I'm sure five years from now, I'll look back at these tapes and go, Mm -hmm. wow, there are things that, you know, I'm doing now that I wish I would have been able to like do then. So I think it's a constant growing process, which is kind of the fun part of this job. And um, you know, just getting better. That's amazing. And I think I'm happy you brought that up because it's so true. I think it's very important to, to take a step back, you know, like just take a step back and look at what you've accomplished so far, because half the time you'd like, I've realized when I've done this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually did accomplish the goals that I set out to do. And I'm like, I didn't Uh, realize that I've done these things. So mm -hmm. it's kind of cool when you take a step back and you look, okay, what have I done this year? And it really, kind of surprises you and you're like, wow, yeah. I did do a good job this year and I am getting better. Um, and I think that's so cool that you can look at back at your tapes and, and realize that. And the other thing too, I think what I've learned, I mean, not that I'm like an on air live reporter or anything, but just with like creating content and doing this podcast, mm-hmm. what I've learned is the more you do it, 
the better you get. It's just practice. Yeah. Like the yep. more, and like you said, like the more and more you do it, the more and more you grow and the more and more you can show of yourself and just like really be sure of yourself. So I, I think that's an wow. awesome, awesome lesson. Um, so one thing, I, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but I want to know, what do you think is the best and the worst thing about being a sports reporter? Um, ooh, that's hard. Because uh, the, the worst thing is probably like the worst to me, but maybe not to somebody else. But I really am not like, I would do it in a ball cap, and with dirt on my face every single time. Like I, I'm not a big fan of like the putting on a huge face of makeup and curling my hair specifically. And it just, it's, it's not something I'm good at. So it's probably why I don't love it very much. Um, so to me, that's like one of the less fun parts. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's hard to even say like, that's the worst, like cry me a river. I have to like put right. makeup on for work. <laughs> like it's just being an adult. And so, um, but I think the best part is still the reason I originally wanted to get into it. And the best part is when you have a conversation with a player and they trust you enough to tell you something that is not public knowledge, that is not in the game notes, that is not in the stat sheet and they trust you enough with that information that you will then relay that in a way that honors the intent of what they're telling you. And so to me, those are still the moments that I'm like, this is the best. This is when I feel the most alive is when I get to be that liaison between the player and the fans that love them so much because, I mean, I look around at the games that I'm sitting in the press box and I look at the hundreds of thousands sometimes fans that would have given anything to talk to Damian Lillard right. before the game. And I'm sitting here going, wow, he talked to me. And like, mm -hmm. I need to make sure that I not only honor, you know, Dame and my working relationship, but also honor my responsibility to the fans and bringing them the information that they care about. And so I think those are the things that still to me are like, this is why I got into it, you know? Oh my gosh, you have such a cool perspective on your job. I think, <laughs> I I mean, not that I've heard many reporters say like why they love their job, but I, <laughs> I don't know if many would say like that they have the honor of talking to whoever, who, whoever it may be. And, you know, it's their duty to like relay that information back to the fans or whoever it is. Um, I just think that's so cool that you <laughs> that you think of it like that. That's amazing. Um, and how do you like build that trust factor with yeah. the players that you speak with? Um, I think it's I think at least part of it is that probably 80 to 90 percent of the conversations I have with them are off air because mm -hmm. they don't they don't matter to the fan, but they matter because I've given them a chance to know me a little bit better and right. I've told them a part of who I am. And so I've let them in a little bit of who I am as a person. And then they've turned around and done the same thing. And what they've told me has no bearing on how they're playing or what the game is or anything, but it has a bearing on us establishing a working, trusting relationship. Right. And, you know, I was, speaking at a college um, a couple days ago, actually, at the University of Oregon, and they asked me, you know, what's the difference? Or, like, some people complain about reporters being too buddy-buddy with players and, like, trying to be friends with them as opposed to being reporters or whatever. And I was like, I, I mean, I guess, like, to somebody who's only interested, there, there are a lot of people who know the game of basketball better than I do. I never played. I can't shoot a basket to save my life. Like if my life depended on it, I would lose my life if I had to make a basket. I'm so bad. Oh and gosh. it's like, it's embarrassing. I'm working on it. But um, there are people who know so much more about the intricacies of the actual game, the pick and roll, the blocks, the schemes, all that stuff. Whereas I know that that's not a strength of mine in basketball. So I'm not going to go out there and try to like, tell you that when someone else is doing a way better job. But one of the things I am pretty good at is figuring out what makes a player tick. Why is it that they're be having a better game this game than any other game? Why is this season different than another season? And so to somebody who's interested in that X's and O's thing, it could come across as like, well, she's just interested in being buddy, buddy or, you know, whatever. 
but that's not the case. To find mm-hmm. out what makes them tick, I have to get to know them. And mm, so totally. it's like, it's this give and take of, you know, obviously there are lines that you never cross, but that doesn't mean that you can't be friendly, working, trusting relationship with these mm-hmm. guys. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I think it's, that is so true. And I feel like a lot of times, honestly, female reporters kind of get that um, backlash and it sucks because the thing is with you, what you said earlier, what your superpower is, like, you know how to like relate to the players that you're talking to and the people that you're interviewing. And I think that, yeah, you should have a relationship with them because like you said, you have to build that relationship in order to build that trust. It's not like you're going off and hanging out with them like outside of the game, you know? Right. But when you do meet with them, like whenever you are interviewing, whenever you are at a game, you do have to build that that relationship, that network. That's what it's like in any business. Like whenever you're with a client or whoever it may be, like you have to have a working, good, fundamental, trusting business relationship in order to trust each other and yeah, and have them be able to like tell you the things that they do in your interviews. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's really cool that you like own that and you're like, Hey, like, that's what I'm good at. And that's what I'm good at talking about. So if you don't like it, (laughs) fine. (laughs) Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that like, these guys are human too, you know, like at the end of the day, Yes, they have a lot of money. Yes, they're very good at a sport. And yes, they have a lot of the spotlight on them. But they're human too. Mm -hmm. And like Dame, for example, is a new dad. Like if you don't think that that has affected the way he lives his life, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know what I don't know what to tell you because there's no way that bringing a child into your home that is you, you know, Mm -hmm. like there's no way that doesn't affect your life. And so things like that you have to remember that this is their job. And just Mm -hmm. like I have things outside of my job that stress me out, that bring me down, bring me up, the same thing happens with these guys. The difference is that a lot of people want to know why Mm -hmm. their job is affected. You know, like, why is it they're so much better this year or worse this year or better, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And to understand that, you have to remember that they're human. They're not a robot who just shows up (laughs) and plays a basketball game. Like, Mm -hmm. They have a lot of things going on outside that sometimes they bring to work. And so I think that it's just, I never want a player to leave an interaction with me feeling like, oh, she was just here to get a quote or she was just mm-hmm. here to get a sound bite. Like, mm. and that's more of like a personal thing. You know, I would never, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want to feel like somebody's just trying to get something out of me. Like, mm-hmm. That's miserable. And so I'm just not going to treat another person like that, regardless of who they are. Right. Yeah. I love that. Oh my gosh. You have inspired me. I love everything that you've said. You like, like our friend, our mutual friend, Lauren said, you are a badass. And I just think everything that you've talked about is so cool. And I think that it it is the reason why you do so well at what you do. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very inspiring and encouraging. So, um, well, do you have any final thoughts, any advice for, our high school and college student athletes regarding, you know, sports journalism or playing sports or anything at all? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing that I think the only advice you can give someone, which it's so hard to follow, which (laughs) it's so hard to follow, but I think it really is like figure out, figure out you first, like what makes you tick? What do you want to do? And figure out like however big the dream is, dream the dream and then work back from there. If your dream is to be on the sideline for the Super Bowl, then go do that and like mm-hmm. take that big dream and then work backwards. Okay, what's the step before that? What's the step before that? What's the step before that until you get to where you are and then every decision that's presented to you, you check it against that original dream and you decide if it is in line with that. Whether that is you want to play in the Super Bowl, you know, you make decisions based on playing in the Super Bowl. And so you make that decision when you're faced with a college decision, you make that decision when you're faced with getting a nutrition coach versus not like all these things. And I think for me, that what that's what kept me, I guess, kind of going in the years that were harder um, 
in Arkansas was just this reminder that this still falls in line. It's not the, it's not a fun part about like (laughs) the achieving of the dream, but Mm -hmm. it is still in line with what I want to do. And so I'm going to keep getting better here until I can go to the next thing. And so, um, I think that's the biggest thing is just figure out what it is that makes you tick and just stick to it because there's a whole lot of people who want to do what you want to do whether it's be a pro soccer player be a pro football player like I don't care what it is there's a lot who want to do it there's only one of you and so figure out figure out why you will thrive in that role and Mm -hmm. go from there oh my gosh I love that goosebumps the whole (laughs) time that was so good I oh yeah I think that's so true I'm not even gonna say anything because that was just as good (laughs) with you saying it. So my final question for you is what does playing like a girl mean to you? Oh man, I think playing like a girl to me means giving it your best shot. You're all in and then just sitting back and watching the reaction as you prove people wrong. Oh, love that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Can I talk to you every day? (laughs) That yes. was so yes. good. Oh my gosh, AJ. Well, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Um, you're super inspiring. We may have to have you come back for like round two at some point, I swear. So <laughs> um, before you go, where can everyone find you? Um, plug yourself. I know obviously we talked about coin um, a little bit, but yeah, mm-hmm. where can everyone find you on TV, on social, everything? Yeah. So I'm on coin um, most days, which is in Portland. So if you're in the Portland area, make sure you watch coin. We're the best. <laughs> Um, and if, um, if you're not in Portland, then I am online on all the social media, AJ underscore McCord for everything. Um, and I do a ton of any of you who have wanderlust like I do. I, my media is about, uh, 70, 30 sports to outdoors. So I do a lot of exploring here in Oregon and we've got some beautiful places. So if you need any inspiration to get outside it's a good one too not just for sports here but there's plenty of that because we're in all of them right now amazing so cool well thank you so much again aj for coming on the podcast yeah thanks for having me awesome Oh my gosh, ladies. So good, right? I love this episode and I hope you loved it just as much as me. I think AJ gives so much good advice and I just, I we keep getting amazing guests and I'm just loving it. So if you loved this episode, make sure to share this episode with a friend who you think will enjoy this podcast. I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts on this episode. So head to iTunes to leave a review. You can also send any questions or topics you'd like us to cover by sending us a DM on Instagram at playlikeagirlmp. We want to know what you want to hear. Before you go, screenshot this episode and tag us at Play Like a Girl MP so we know you're listening alongside us. Thank you so much for listening to episode 15 of Play Like a Girl. We hope you come back for more. Once again, I'm Nikki B, and remember to never stop playing like a girl. You play ball like a girl!